My wife's Ramari. We're from California, from the West Kingdom. And uh, thank you very, very much for, for asking us here and, and having us here. We're very humbled by that and uh, really appreciative that you would uh, take the time and, and spend your day out here with us, uh, listening to, to us uh, talk today and, and, and go through some things. But first off, we want to say thank you very, very much for having us. We've been up here a couple times before. We love it here. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk loud, but if you can't hear, just, you know, raise your hand, yell at me, uh, and we'll try to get out through. So, because it's, it's noisy, but we'll, we'll get through the background noise, it's not a problem. So, we're going to talk a little bit about, today, the basics of measure, and we're going to talk about how understanding this helps you in your fighting and helps you with how you can fight an opponent, any opponent, with any weapon. Um, the, the important thing to remember here is I'm of the one mind, any weapon concept. I'm of the one mind, any weapon. So you should not have to switch gears in your head when you're fighting different things. What you need to do is understand the concept of measure. And oddly enough, we're going to go through the concept of measure as it was gone through in the Middle Age. Yay. Crazy. I know. Yay. I know. So let's get a couple things straight first off. Number one. I'm not, we're not going to talk about the basics of power generation. We'll do that later. And how you throw a sword and how I throw a sword is probably different. And we're not going to talk about the who's and why's of it. Um, as I say in most classes, I'm not from anybody's school. I'm not of the Paul school. I'm not of the Sean school. I'm not of the Jade school. I'm not any of those schools. Okay? Um, and I take everything that I teach um, from medieval sources and practical application. What I teach and what I do is not completely medieval because there's no way I could honestly say that. I wasn't there. And I don't understand 14th century Italian or 1400 Swabian. I don't get it. And neither do you, neither does anybody else. I'll give you a quick example of that. One of the, one of the people, the foremost authorities on Fiore, uh, who was a master in Italy, northern Italy, um, is a guy named Bob Karen, SCA guy was from Colantier, Count, um, has done research for the past 13 years on the Fiore manuscripts. There's only four in existence that are public. There's one in private. There's four in public. Bob has done more work on these books than probably anybody in the world. And when he first started doing works on these books, some of you guys, uh, men and women, have probably taken, taken classes uh, for things that he's written on. And in the early classes, they talk about the different guards, right? Iron gate, boar's tooth, window guard, long guard, the woman's guard, right? They're going through and they're going through, and lots of people learn it that way. So about eight years into the concept of writing his books and his stuff, he's working with a guy from Italy, an Italian national whose specialty is 14th century dialect from northern Italy. And they're looking over completely different things, and while Bob's talking with him over the concepts of writing his book, the guy goes, you know, all these other ones, the Iron Gate, I like, Boar's Tooth, yeah, Window, yeah, I get that, get that. Because the Woman's Guard, I have a problem with them. And Bob says, really, why? And he goes, you know, with the speech, the way it was talked about in those days, the inflection, the colloquialisms of the day, I don't really think that's what it says. And Bob says, really? What do you think it says? And he goes, you know, by looking at it, putting all those things together, I really think it means the mother of all guards. And everybody across the United States went, <laughs> <laughs> because of course it does, right? This is the mother of all guards. Everybody uses it. You can throw and guard from anywhere from here, right? Nine years into the research, nine years into the research. So the concepts that we're talking about are not mine alone. The concepts that we're talking about uh, are the best translations that we have and the best work that I can summon up from a lot of years of practical application. I've been teaching uh, a martial arts style called Afamakia, which literally translates to fighting in armor for 10 years. Um, we have a school down in Southern in California, down south, uh, and we have taught hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, all the same concept, all the same way. But we want to talk about the basics of it. No matter how experienced of a fighter you are, Understanding these concepts can only help you. 
that can only enrich what you're doing as a fighter, as somebody who's pursuing a martial art. And so we're going to first off talk about measure, and we're going to talk about what you can do with it, and the, what's called the order of measure, right? And this goes along with any fight, any fighter, any weapon style, any system, okay? Any shield style. Any of you who have seen uh, the video or came to the class that I did on shields uh, have seen the strength and weaknesses of shields that I put out um, and how we color coat them and, and use them for training. I use a lot of very basic concepts for training and uh, uh, I really believe in foundational basics. I, found, I really believe in hammering foundations into you until you cannot help but do them. I come from an Asian style background I started in martial arts when I was seven years old in a very traditional Korean school. And so I'm very well versed and you will do basics until you die. So uh, we'll go over that quite a bit. So starting off, we're going to talk about the fight in itself, right? And how we prepare for a fight. Now there's lots of mental things that people do and things like that, but we're going to talk about the physical fight itself right now. You're getting into the fight, you're about to begin the duel. Make no mistake, this is a duel. Right? You are dueling another human who is attempting to take your life. And the mindset of the duel must be put first every single time. You must be put in that if you get hit in any way, shape, or form, you fail. The number one objective of any martial art is to hit and not be hit back. Every martial art in the world works on this principle. It's nice and all you have armor, but the object and the perfection of a martial artist is to strike and not be struck back. To not rely on that armor saving you. Most of the time it will, lots of times it won't. Okay? We're going to talk about some of the myths of real armor, what it does and what it can't do. What a sword will and will not do. There's lots of things a sword can do. There's lots of things a sword will not do. Go through a helmet's one of them. I've broken more swords than most people have ever seen. I've never gone through a helmet. Um, so, to start off, we're going to talk about the fight itself, the space of the fight, what is called measure. And we're taking measure from Aristotle's view. Aristotle being the leading scientist of the time and his views talking about measure and movement. Measure, by definition, is the distance between you and your opponent. That's it. The distance between you and your opponent. Now, I understand there's lots of concepts of range, right? A range, B range. C range, D range, right? Range, ranges, all that. There's no range. You're in measure or you're not. That's it. That's all you have to remember. You are either in measure or you're not. Either your opponent can hit you and you can hit them or you can't. If you can't hit them, you're not in measure. That's it. So if Okta and I are fighting and we are here, measure is not an issue because neither of us can hit each other. Right? Unless we're shooting crossbows, nobody can hit each other from here. There's no range. Either you're in measure or you're not. I am not in measure. But once I get to here with swords, we can now strike each other. We are now in measure, and therefore both of us are in danger. You are not safe here. They are not safe here. Now it is a gunfight, sort of, and we'll get to why. But here we are in measure. Both of us can be struck. Both of us can strike. When people talk about you know, don't be in the X. Anywhere you're, you can reach somebody, it's your X, right? Unless you're standing straight up and down and don't move. Everywhere around you is an X, as long as they're in range, right, in measure. So, the edge of measure is right at that point where I cannot reach him without taking a small step, a half step. This little bit right here. That's the edge of measure. If I can't reach him here with my huge long sword, but I can reach him here. I am at the edge of measure. That's it. You should be fighting from here. Not from here. <laughs> he smells so good. <laughs> Most of the time we see in a fight, guy says, stand you ready? Yes, yeah. stand you ready? Yes, lay on. Stomp, stomp, stomp. Bang, bang, bang. Whack, 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 whack. Somebody dies. Right? That isn't a fight. That is flailing until somebody gets hit. Right? I get in trouble for this all the time, and I'm going to start it off now 
you might as well. If you're out here and you're throwing and throwing and throwing and somebody gets hit, you have to choose. You want to be nightly good and act as if it's candy falls out. Take your pick. Up to you. But you must understand the tools that you're using. The tools that you're using, the first defense you have is measure. It's not your shield. The first defense you have is this space. Think of it as a, you guys, everybody see Jaws, right? This scared the hell out of me. You ever see Jaws, right? Think of this right here as a pond. And as soon as you step in, this big effing shark <laughs> is about to chomp you up, because that's where right here is, right? Are you going to stand belly up to Octo right here or him? No. Give your answer now. No. Hell no. You stand the edge of measure and you have to work this. Measure comes in order. There are three rules to the order of measure. This is all you've got to remember. Okay? As I said, measure is a definition, the distance between you and your opponent. Once inside measure, the rule of measure is distance, time, and line. Distance, time, and line. This is spoke about in every martial art I've ever studied. In 34 years of martial arts, four black belts. Not that that's impressive, it's not. It's a big waste of time sometimes. But what it is, is it's absolutely confirming the fact that every martial art I've ever studied has the concept of measure, and every concept of measure has distance, time, and line. The Japanese call it ma'ai. In ma'ai, there are three terms in, in, for the ma'ai, distance, time, and line. Every single martial art in the world uses it because it's effective, and it's because it is the way you go into and out of a fight. So the first part, measure itself, I'm at the edge of measure here. I can't reach him, he can't reach me. Once I step in, we're both in danger, right? This is distance, the distance between myself and my opponent. But once we are in measure, once we are here, next in the list is time. They're always in this order, they never switch. They never ever switch. Once I am here, time becomes most important because now distance is, we're in distance. Now time goes, right? Here is the gunfight. You're here, they're here, everybody's doing this, and then somebody throws, and then it's on, right? Then it's on. Aristotle's theory on measure. It begins by an action. If there is no action, time does not exist. Remember, in the medieval mind, in the medieval mind, time is linear, right? Einstein didn't screw it up with relativity yet. Time is linear. Therefore, an action must happen. So if you think of a stopwatch above Octa's head and a stopwatch above my head, if Octa throws first, somebody clicks his stopwatch, and he is always ahead on time. Now, I know this may seem a little weird and, and out there for a second, but I promise you it's about to make sense. I promise you it's about to make sense. Octa is always ahead on time. So if he throws first, I have to either die or defend, right? He threw first, I have to defend or I'm dead. So he's always ahead on time. Time for the medieval mind is linear, as I said. And because of that, it changes by the distance that you're at. If I am 10 feet away from Hakta and I walk towards him, it may take me three seconds. If I run at him, stupid although it is, it may only take me a second, but it's the same distance. It is changed, the time has changed because of that, right? So, he throws first. I have to defend. He's always ahead on time, right? So, let's, uh, let's look at this half. Would you hold that? So, I'll, you go to your left hand. So, Octa throws the first blow at my head, and I block, right? He throws the second blow. He's already ahead on time, right? He's already ahead on time. This second blow or the third one is where you die, correct? Most of you? Yeah? Yeah? Uh -huh. Okay. Get, what's your name? Bokutai. Bokutai? Come here, Bokutai. You ever play this game? <laughs> right? You ever play that game? You do it. Okay, I'll do it. Good, do it. Good, do it. Good, do it. Good. Bokutai starts first, right? 
He starts. My action is never going to catch up with his. The odds for him, there's been scientific studies. Don't ask. Me. Welcome to the government. <laughs> there's been scientific He's always faster than me. Always faster than me here, right? Always faster than me. Thank you. Because of that, if I simply stay here and try to beat him with my arm, in other words, move my shield, just my shield, he's always in the advantage. Doesn't mean he's always going to win, but it means he's always in the advantage. Everybody following so far? Okay, so we're in measure. Got that out of the way. Now it's time. He threw first. I'm defending. Throws over here, I'm defending. Throws over here, I'm defending. And then we die somewhere in here, right? Because I can't beat him. Go back and look at your videotape. Go back and look at your stuff. You go bang, bang, ah, bang. Right? Because this happens. They go whack, 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 whack. Right? Because the time got changed on us and we didn't see it. We weren't fast enough to do it. Right? I'll give you a, a, another example. What's your name? Gavin. Gavin? Uh, we've met, right? Yes. Okay, Gavin. So, Gavin, do this with me. Okay? Just stand right there. Okay? Clap with me. <laughs> I'm that guy in the rock show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm controlling the time. Gavin doesn't know what it is. He's not fast enough to get his hands going again after I start and he sees the motion. That's why you die with your shield in your hand that way. That's why. Because you cannot catch up by just standing there and moving your arm. He's already had on time. Aristotle knew this. Fiore knew this. Tallhofer, Wiesenhauer all knew this. And that's what they preached. The, the base, the very bedrock of what they taught was about time, line, measure. The sword play was always an afterthought. It was always, this is what you can do with understanding the basics of time and measure. Right? And it happens with every weapon and non-weapon system in the world. Understanding measure, understanding time, a distance, time, and line. Always in that order. Okay, so now we get to line, right? Octa has his weapon, I'm defending, and he throws the first one, bang! He throws the second one. How do I beat it? How do I actually get ahead or do something about it? I change the line. Remember we talked about it takes three seconds to walk or one second to walk? By moving my feet, I didn't have to move my arm. I changed the distance it takes for him to hit me. I changed the line and I blocked. This is not going to defend me. This is changing the line that your opponent is trying to hit you at. That's what defends you. Everybody going, oh. And, and we do it instinctively. But it's comforting to know that it's centuries nay, probably thousands of year old, years old in their concept, right? Vegetus in the third century talked about the Roman centurion being required to take a pole six feet once it is planted into the ground without swaying and practicing with a double-weighted sword and a wicker shield. And he doesn't talk about the sword strokes, he says, so they therefore can practice their footwork. Because even in a Roman legion in the lines, they were required to know how to move on their feet. When you enter a fight, the fight hasn't started here. The fight has started here. This is where you should be preparing for the fight. Of course you're going to look at your opponent and see what armor they're wearing. Of course you're going to look at the shield and the weapon, whether they're using a spear, a great sword, um, uh, a glaive, a uh, stupid stick, uh, what's it called, Madu, uh, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever they're using, yes, you're going to take that into consideration, but you're always going to use it with the concept of measure. Now, how does this change according to the weapons? Well, if, um, if Octa has a spear, and he's holding a spear, and the tip of the spear is here, then the edge of measure is here. Right? Because he has to be able to take a half step to hit me. I don't want him to be able to hit me without moving. He has to take a step to hit me. So the edge of measure is here. 
the edge of measure is always dictated by the distance of the threat from your opponent. So no matter what weapon they're using, you have to understand speed. It's what you must understand. And a lot of times, because, let's be honest, this is not a formal martial art. This is a volunteer thing. You show up to practice. You just want to get in and fight. We don't practice our footwork. We don't practice our movement. We don't practice why we're standing where we're standing. Let alone what is in this measure and how to use it. This right here will win you more battles and more duels than any sword blow you've ever known. You can wait out even the, the best of fighters and pick your shots. You're going to be, you're going to survive a lot longer for it. Because eventually a good fighter, what are, what are they going to do? They're going to lull you in, right? They're going to get you in where they want you and then they're going to get you out of position and kill you. Right? Your job as an attacker, as your offense, is to get your opponent undefendable into, a, into a, a target that's undefendable, right? You are completely defendable out here. You are not so good here, especially if you're not moving. Medieval fencing was an incredibly dynamic art. It had a lot of movement to it. Why? Because it was a three-foot razor, and if you got hit, you died. Okay? Plate armor was the very end of us, the very end of us, but for almost a thousand years before that, it was all about don't get hit, because you'll break bones. You'll break bones, especially under chainmail. You can break bones. Gambesons are fantastic things. These are more essential than the chainmail you wear. You don't have one of these on, it's not going to help your impact at all. Then you have the chainmail over the top and the boiled leather, right? These items are incredibly important to us. But not being there and not getting hit by a broadsword is seriously important. To do that, you would not run into the fray and stand here and hope for the best. Your shield would get chewed. Your sword would get caught into their wooden shield because bladed objects do that in wood, obviously, weirdly enough. So you'd stay out of range, out of measure, and you would cautiously intermeasure to open your opponent up through timing and line. Through time and line. Okay, so if you learn nothing else from what we're talking about today, understand that measure itself has to do with the three rules. Distance, time, and line. And if you consistently think about distance, time, and line, you can work your opponent open without having to do it here when they throw first and you're already behind. If you're already behind, this is no place to try to catch up. Okay? So, now you have to figure out how to practice that. How do you get used to understanding what your measure is? Well, first you have to know your own equipment, right? What is the potential of your sword? How long is it? What's your shield like? What sort of weapons are you using? And how close do you need to be to strike? And then you have to constantly fight folks to get a good grasp of what their weapon range is, right? So I know if Octa's using a 38 inch sword, whatever, I don't want to be any closer than this because, well, he can hit me. And then as I get in and move him, then we can go ahead and go to work. But the concept of understanding that space, the distance, the time, and the line, is something that you have to have as your foundation before you ever get into the fight. Before you ever get into the fight. And that's an important thing. How can we practice this at home? Has everybody got a Pell? Most people got a Pell? So you start off with the Pell outside of measure. And you take a half step in striking. And get used to training your brain on what that distance looks like. So at least you can predict and you can consistently know what your measure is. Then you can start practicing against other people's. Okay? One of the things that we do not do as a group or individually is practice enough on the basic essentials that can build the foundations to make us better fighters. I don't mean going to fighter practice. Another one's gonna get me in trouble, but here we go. Fighter practice is not training. Fighter practice is sparring and getting results from the things that you should have trained already. How many times do you sit at home and do your footwork? Do you know what your footwork is? Do you change it for a reason? Do you 
you know what your steps are? Do you step on the heel or on the ball of the foot? Do you step on the heel or the ball of the foot? Always the ball of the foot. Do you keep your feet shoulder width and never like this? Always shoulder width or wider? Because you're in armor, right? This doesn't bode well for knee cops. And this is a standing position. Have you ever seen somebody attack or defend from here that's not in Kung Fu? <laughs> Never. So why should you be here? The stance itself and the footwork alone, if you haven't mastered that, you're not mastering your art. How can you get, if, if I practice on the Pell and I want to get my distance, so I'm here and I'm going to throw and hit, bang. And I'm going to throw and hit, bang. Now I'm going to move in. How am I going to move in? Am I going to move in this way? Hmm. If he's a right-handed fighter, I'm just giving him my leg. A good swordsman is going to watch you and cut you off by which foot you're going to step forward in, aren't you? Because <laughs> you do it. <laughs> but that's exactly what you do. So when you march in, do you march in a half step at a time, taking inches as you should? Or do we march in, trudge, 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 bang, 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 bang! Oh, look, candy! <laughs> right? These simple basics are something that a lot of times people just overlook. But Coming from the background that I do, I find them essential. I find them more important than any, any of the practice cuts that you can think of. The Molinese, the wraps, and the, the cool movements, and all the, the cool gear with cool names. They're great, but you cannot do them effectively if you are not training the basics effectively. And that's why I think uh, the basic training is so very, very important. Um, I proposed a, 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 I'm proposing a class. I got invited to, to teach at Sport of Kings. I, my class that I'm proposing is Introduction to the Sword. Seems basic enough, but I'm bringing real swords. Oh. Real sharp ones. To cut real things. With them separated. This is a pommel. This is why the pommel works. This is a grip. This is the shape of a grip of a sword. How many people you know has never swung a real blade before? Right? That's going to be my class. Introduction to the sword. How an actual medieval sword works. This isn't a slicing tool. It's a hacking weapon. Hacking and slicing are two completely different animals. Slicing hits and slices through, much like an Asian-style samurai sword. Right? This is built to strike in what's called the sweet spot, foilable here, and impact and destroy everything it hits. Okay? I have news, even though you've probably seen it, Hitting the sword here is not good. That whole short stick thing, do it with a real blade. It'll jar your wrist all the way down to here. Because the blade's not built to do it. Not to mention the fact, according to Oakshot, 90% of the swords that are in museums or Riverborn that they brought back out are not sharp the first 68 inches. They're bludgeons. Because of the Zorn how if you attack the blade. So you don't want to do it on a sharp end, you'll destroy your sword. Okay. So, when we talk about this basics class, starting with measure itself is absolutely important. The reason being is because we have to understand not only what the masters were talking about, but the foundation of our art, what we're trying to create. And we want to be able to speak of it to other people. Right? One of the things in, in the school I tell people all the time, they ask me, what's it like to teach? What's it like the, this and that? Well, first rule is, if you can't answer a seven-year-old, you suck. Flat out. I want you to hold your feet like this and move this way. Why? Because he did it that way. Or I said so. Don't fly. Doesn't fly. I want you to put your feet this way. And then when you get into measure, I want you to step forward here. Why? Because I'm taking away the first target from a right-handed fighter. Because I'm turning my shoulders and getting more distance for him. Because I'm creating an angle to his weapon. Right? Because all of these things say I should. That's why, and we have to understand the why of what we're doing, not just flailing because it works. Brute force will not beat a good martial artist. Brute force will never beat a good martial artist. A good martial artist will wait you out. If you're fast, will wait your speed. If you're strong, will wait your strength and take your head off right for it. Doesn't matter how big you are, doesn't matter how tall you are, doesn't matter how muscular you are, you're all a foot and a half tall when you're laying on the ground. 
and the best martial artists in the world know this, right? Fiori was probably this big. So when we discuss fighting, we discuss how we get in and out. So what we're talking about is how we get in and out of measure. Not only do we get in, but once we've made our strike, do we go, ta-da, dig me, whoa. We stay on guard and we back out, cover. Because again, if you get hit, coming back out, you fail. You fail. I'm a firm believer double kills should be kills. You should get no prize for committing suicide. There's no, in the school especially, there is no to be refought immediately. Double kills, you're dead, get off the floor. In medieval context, they call it dupio. Dupio means double death. You're done. You're done. So, when you take your training, and you get out there and you start sparring and you're doing things, what level are you putting yourself to? The level you want to put yourself to is the basic premise of every martial art. To strike and not be struck. To get in and out without being hit. That means use your shield, use your measure, use your angle. Use your line. All of those things are the foundations of how we get there. Okay? Tell it! Dude! 11.25. <laughs> We're going to take a 10 minute break, let you guys get some water. When we come back, we'll have a sword and shield in our hand, and we're going to talk a little bit about the angle of measure as we get in. Okay? All right, 10 minutes. Kids. 
don't you ever say no to it. You always say, this is where we should go. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. I'm training symmetrically. You don't do push-ups just this way. Right? Push-ups this way. You do all your workouts with both sides of your body, but you don't train the sword and shield that way? You have to. If you don't own a shield that can switch both hands, get one, make one. Get on the pedal and fight both hands. What's the best way to kill the left-hander? Off the fight him left-handed? Hell yes. Fight him left-handed. Tall Hopper says it takes courage to be a swordsman. You cannot take the clang and din of battle or stand in the position to be struck at by another man with a blade in his hand. Perhaps you should not pursue this effort. It takes strength and courage to train yourself, right? We forge our bodies in the fire of our will. Bruce Lee, Enter the Dragon. <laughs> True story. True story. Just what you did here, that measure and just that half step takes hours of practice. Learning what your opponent does in that is invaluable to you in the fight. Because if I notice they're dragging that back foot up, I know that they've committed the measure and they're too far in. If they step too far over or they step in their own center line, I know they're off balance and a lateral motion will get them off kilter. Just by what they did in their footwork. We haven't even got to hitting anybody yet. We haven't even got to what angle you're supposed to take against them. All we've done is gone into measure. That's it. If you noticed when somebody was in measure and they started throwing at you, all of a sudden it was a matter of, I can get it, I can barely get it. Oh, I got it, because I moved my feet. But often, when you get into the real fight, you don't. You plant, and then this happens. There is, there, here comes another one. There, put your shield up. There's no difference between that shield and this shield. There's no difference between this shield and that shield. This happens to be the pinnacle of sword play. You want to be a badass swordsman? Go. But there's no difference between these shields. It still covers the same area because of the angles you use. Because of the line and the mastery of the measure that you use, right? To really conquer measure, you must put yourself in a position of danger to do so. Now, we have not been accused of being the brightest folks ever. We'll stand there and fight injured, we'll fight hurt, we'll fight sick, right? We'll fight when we know we shouldn't be fighting, we'll fight cold, right? Because what's the answer? Yes, your majesty. We will go fight, but we might as well do it with good mastery and practice in our minds, right? You would not pursue any other activity without knowing the absolute essentials of what you're doing. I am an electrician in the real world. I would not pretend to go and practice with high voltage if I did not know all of my basics as a journeyman to do so. I would die. Jumping in the middle of a fight against an expert swordsman, hoping to glean something before my head gets turned into a canoe, is not conducive to learning. Because usually I don't remember what happened when I got hit. Right? <laughs> Understanding the mastery of what you are doing every step and every inch of the way is how you become an expert in your how you become an extra expert in your weapon system and how you do it. And there are many things that you can do along the way before you ever get to swing the sword that will help you. I'll give you an example. Um, are you right handed fighter? Yeah. Okay, would you go on guard for me? So if you come out, please. What was your name again? Damn it. Leaf. Leaf. So Leaf is on guard for me. Uh, would you go on guard for me? Come over here with me. And you face him. You're on guard, okay? That's great. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to be here and I want you to be there, okay? Okay? Uh, a little more, a little more. Okay, you facing me, you're on guard. You guys are on guard now? Okay, you're in the on guard position. Are they in range? <laughs> this is the edge of measure. He's about to stand in front of me. There, that's the gunfight already started. You do it by habit. When you come up to your Pell, right? Get up the Pell, line up, ha! No! <laughs> I'm gonna be on my Pell here. And I'm gonna practice at the edge of measure first. Then practice how I would go in. 
and what guards and footwork I would change as I do it. Yeah. Next point. Line, because we're already measured out. Now we're going to get in a little closer. We've got in and we're in closer. Now we can hit each other. Everybody's in. We're in line. You see a straight line from these nose to Brady. What's your name? Bruin. To Bruin's nose. Yes? Yeah. And so Leaf, don't move, Bruin. Don't hit him really in the head. <laughs> Where you would strike him first, Leaf, just put your sword there. Okay, right there, okay? Where would you, where else could you hit him? Right there, good. Where else could you hit him? Right there, good. Okay, now, Bruin, I want you to do this with me, okay? Shuffle over here a little bit. Good. Now, follow me, Bruin. Turn like this. Put your fist towards his weapon. Okay? This weapon, right there. Now, Leaf, where are you going to hit him? Well, for this one, now I have to take a little step in. Right, you have to go way the hell up there yep. and get in really, really close. You have to do something overt to hit him, don't you? Yep. Well, for this one, I have to raise my wrist really high or step out with the back foot. But Bruin's in the way! Just from where he stood. Just from where he stood facing the weapon. So, thank you, friend. So, if Leaf and I are facing each other, and we're on guard, and if I stand here straight on at him, and he throws at my head, I have to move the shield up the block. If he throws this side of my head, I have to move the shield up the block. But as I come into measure, and now timing and line are very important to me, if I face the weapon, even with this, Leaf, where the hell are you going to hit me? Mm. Any of those you're going to block? 12 inch buckler, Leaf. So, probably here. Bloody yeah. <laughs> 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 <Bloody> hell. <laughs> the line and angle that you assume when you go into the fight is just as important as understanding the distance and measure as you get into the fight. If I face this nose to nose, man to man, or stand here, hot, anywhere he throws, I have to react. What do we say of timing? He threw first. He's always ahead on time. So I'm starting off behind on time just by standing straight up. Just by standing straight up nose to nose, I'm already starting behind on time. But by walking into measure and getting my line correct, now time is equal. I'm okay. So he throws the first one. Say he takes a step and he throws a wrap. And I shuffle and I block it. If he throws something on this side and I just use my arm, he's ahead on time. I have to blow like hell over here to block it. And I've just turned a very paltry 12 inch blocking surface into a half inch blocking surface. Alternatively, if he throws that wrap and I block it, and then he throws the offside and I shuffle and I change the line, I don't move a damn thing. Fist still pointing towards the weapon. The weapon went over here and so did I. The weapon was over here and so was I. So Leaf, I want you to just throw around a little bit slowly, and I'm going to follow the weapon. Now, 
Bakta has the offside, but once he throws the offside, I shuffle him. To face the weapon. When he shuffles, face the weapon. Always face the weapon. Here. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's right. Thank you. It's old, and it was a monk teaching another guy in tunics. Who knows if he was a knight in a previous life? We don't know. But we do know that consistently, most people that fight the 133 have to change it up a bit to fight against our styles. Yeah? Absolutely. Because you can't cover that that much and not get your arm off the fight of stubby. Yeah? What time is it? Nobody knows? 12 o'clock? Straight, Straight up. Okay. We're going to take 10 minutes. We're going to go. How long am I going? How long am I going? As long as you want. I'm going to stand here and listen to you. Who floor team guy? No, no. So floor team guy is on guard. No problem. That, Weapons are shifted over. I need to center my weapon here. Okay? What you want is to have an open lane. What you want is to have an open lane. So I'm going to start out here. Now, he either has this cut to throw across, or this cut to throw. That's the one I want. Not this one, I don't care about this one. That's the one I want. And one of two things are gonna happen. He's gonna throw low, and it's gonna go into his head. Or he's gonna throw high, and it's gonna go into here as his arm's gonna come. Now, I know that there is this, this kind of a, a bad thing about targeting somebody's arm. Go and guard again. Your arm is in the way to your head. This is the first target to me. It is a foot and a half to two feet closer to me than your head is. I am not going to aim for your leg, your head, or anything else. I'm going to cut you off like stubby right here every single time. <laughs> and beat your hands to death for doing it every single time. Right? Because I don't want his hands out that close to me. He's gaining measure by reaching out. And by reaching out, I'm going to blow him off every single time. Everything I can do to take his hands off. Right? But if you fight Florentine, you center between them, and you wait for the onside blade to come at you. As soon as it touches your shield, you know exactly where the weapon is. Your shield is an extension of your body. You should be able to, as the blow comes, when you're practicing with someone you trust and you have a helmet on, <laughs> Tell them, throw for my leg. As they throw, close your eyes and feel it. Just feel the impact. When you do, you'll realize exactly where the blow is hit, and you know exactly where they're hit. You'll know exactly where their weapon is. Now, we'll get into the strength and weaknesses of the shield here. And we'll talk about how they're strong and how they're weak. But understand that understanding how you get into that fight is hugely more important as you begin your journey in this arc. Because once you're in there, and you're just flailing away, you're never really learning what you're doing. You don't learn why it happens. You have to learn what you're doing and what you're causing to happen. We call this causing an effect. Right? For every action, there's a reaction. He's a smart guy. You should listen to him. For every action, there's a reaction. So what's your name? Thank you. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Go on guard. So, square shield, longer reach, probably longer sword, because there we So, <laughs> where is this? <laughs> Not where is he open, where is the shield weak? Where is the shield weak? I thought you were going to break. Yeah, go on a break and then do this. Then do shield. We'll talk about this after the break. We start with footwork. We start with stance. Lots of people have different names for lots of things. And 
the Altamachian style, we only have four stances, three of which are used for single-handed weapons. The fourth is used for spears. And uh, the basic stance to begin with is, most people know this one, right? Everybody has this one. That blade is stance. Before we get to the shield part, I just want you to understand that you should be able to check everything you do. You should be able to verify it's right every time you do it. And by doing that, you'll be able to help each other. Okay? So, as I said before, you answer a seven-year-old, you really don't need to be teaching anybody. One of the things that you want to make sure of when you're doing these things is you're not walking into your own death. Understanding measure is good. You must have that mastery. But when you do climb into measure, 99.9% .9 of the people will walk right into their own death. Starting with not facing the weapon, right? Face each other nose to nose, we sit out here like this, and we're whacking at each other with open lines already at us. So we're walking in at a disadvantage. But once we've come in and we've come into that line, how do we walk in? What stances are we using? Sometimes we do it and we don't even know why. If I'm facing an opponent here and we're at the edge of measure, we're about to start the duel, I'll most likely be in this big western stance. Right behind you. Lovely. <laughs> but once I get into measure and I know he can strike me, I'm going to take that target away and go into a box stance, weapon side forward. Because it takes this target away and it shuffles my shoulders over to give me longer range. We know that. But we don't have an ex word for it. And when we explain it to a new student, you know, do this. Okay, why do you do this? Why do you do this? Right? You do this because you're taking the target away and you're gathering range. You're gathering range. Fair enough. Once I get in really close, though, with close measure, this becomes a detriment because the wrap is available. So I bring the feet together into a squared stance so I can move laterally where it's most important. Also, uh, in the school, especially, Apamaki is a full martial art. We kick and punch. So I don't ever really want to be here anyway. <laughs> but when I am here, when I am here, kicks are going to be balls. This shot, chassés, fuetes, all kinds of bad things are going to happen. If you want to know what medieval kicks look like? Look up French savant. It's the best lineage thing we have. French savant kicks are still the lineage that we have to modern day medieval kicking, right? Fuentes, sachets, chassés, I should say. Um, all those kicks that come down from French Savant have their roots in medieval fencing. And you can find them in the manuscripts all the way through. All the way through. Look at Maximilian's treaties. Look at Tallhoffer's treaties. Yori shows it. Meyer shows it. A ton of books all show. The kicks are there. One of the best ways that you can make sure that your balance and your footwork is right is when you're practicing on the pel, throw a blow, throw a blow, throw a blow. If you're over here and you can't lift that foot to kick, you are too far over. If you could throw a blow in here and you could pick up both feet, your feet are balanced, and you're okay. <laughs> you should never be over here. You should never be over here. You should never be over here. <laughs> How many times have you heard people at, at practice? Man, I'm trying to get that offside body. I just can't get it today. Just can't get it today. Just can't get it today. Right? Just can't get it. Do you have an offside body shot? Do you have one? Okay, come over here. You're a guard. You're a guard, I'm a guard, okay? And you throw your offside body shot. Hmm. Shields in the way. Hmm. Okay? Stay there. Don't move. Here's the center line. Now throw it. Bloody hell. When you're practicing on the Pell, when you practice your offside body shot, what side of the body did you start on? Did you start on the right side of the game? There's only two ways to get there. One, to be physically on that side of the body. Two, move their center line. If I'm going to throw the offside body, if I physically get to this side of his body, boom, that's it. 
if I'm not physically on that side of his body, hey, boom, fantastic. The center line just went that way three inches, and that's all I needed. Okay. But if you realize that, when you're in the fight, once you come into measure, once you start to throw your blows, at what angles are you throwing? Right now we're defending those angles because we're in measure, and the timing is important, and the line is important. But what lines do you have to return your cuts? And a lot of times you get people off the field, you know, students of nights and things like that off the field, they say, I just, I'm not getting that body today. I'm just not getting that offside body. I'm not, I'm not getting that mullet because they're standing way the hell over here, and they're trying to throw it over here. Impact points way the hell over here, instead of being in front of them. All right? I show the kids in class, I have this great Iron Man toy. You know Iron Man's flashy thingy? The flashy thingy? The flashy thingy should be always pointing at the target when you hit it. So if I'm here like this, flashy thingy's out there. Great rock star pose, not so good for hitting. Here it throws all the focus into what I'm doing. Okay. This is body mechanics of the big thing this fight. So for the last little bit of this, we're going to talk about simply the strength and weakness of the shield. And I'm talking about power generation or any of that other, because that's an argument I don't even want to hear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to talk about any of that. Um, what we are going to talk about is the strength and weakness of the shield. It's the last part of this. We've taken measure. The rule of measure is this distance, measure. Time, time, and line. It never changes. That never, ever changes. Distance, time, and line. Never change, okay? Let me test that. Now that we're in measure, distance is accomplished, time and line. The time and line you have to focus on by your defense, yes? But now when you're gonna go strike, now you're gonna actually go and kill that opponent. We have to look at our weapons and we have to look at what they are defending with. That gives us our lines. That gives us our lines to strike at. So we need to understand the strength and weakness of the shields. Now, if you saw my shield class, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen my shield class, essentially, here's the bare bones of it. You can go to Rifkin's YouTube channel, and my entire thing on strength and weakness of shields is on the YouTube channel. Go there and look at it. So basically, we're going to talk about this. Who's got a heat? Bring it up. Okay. Go on, guard. So, strength and weakness of a heater. Shields are always weakness on their flats or their cutaways. They're always strongest on their corners. Again, they're, they're weak on the flats and the cutaways, and they're always strongest at their corners. So the strength of the shield is here, here, and here. He's weak here, here, notice the angle I'm cutting at, and here, not here. This is why heater shields are always destroyed in this corner first because everybody throws straight forward. Two reasons for that. First of all, if I'm facing him nose to nose, that's my shot. If I'm facing his weapons, that's my shot. Kind of cool, but true. Sir, what are you facing the sword? What do you use to line up? My fist or my shield fist? There. Your shield fist or my sword fist? Right here. I'm cutting down, I'm not cutting a leg like this. Or out. Sharp weapon within shield sticks. <laughs> okay. So we have to understand the reality of what a blade will do. We'll get in that later. Right now we have to understand this is the weak point. I should always be throwing for either here, here, or here. If I'm throwing past the shield. Now if I get past him and I throw out here, cool. But as far as being in front of him and working his shield. I should always be throwing from either here, here, or here. Always. If I throw from the corner, I just wasted a blow. Because he's strongest there. Because he's strongest there, all right? And you need to know where the pivot points are so you can manipulate a shield. Shield manipulations are very important. Touching somebody with your shield is not. Don't 
touch me with your shield, I don't kick you in the junk. <laughs> <laughs> that whole thing where, oh, I'm going for your basket hill. Here's my basket hill right here. You don't. It's not my. So, chasing him. <laughs> no, weak, weak, weak. Want to have some fun? Get your trading partner and put white tape right there, right there, and right there. And always throw for the white tape. They're not going to like you, <laughs> but that's where you can visually practice where the weak lines of the shield are. Octa shield is a rectangle. It's weak in between the corners. Here, 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 and here. It's a center grip, so it has pivot points all over it. All shields have pivot points all over them. The main one is here, here, and here. This shield has a fantastic pivot point. Don't let him push it, okay? That's really good. Right? Got it? Strong guy. Got it? Hold on to it. Don't move it. Okay? I'm going to stab you right here. Ready? Hold on. Got it? Good. <laughs> Every shield has a strength and weakness. If you know where it is, the subtlety of it will give you advantage over the lines of the shield. Subtlety is key. Subtlety is key. You must spec broke here. Well, Warcraft people know what I'm talking about. You must know. You must know. There, it keeps coming out now. You must know where to use your subtlety in the shield. Once I'm close enough to manipulate the shield, it's the last thing he needs to know about before it happens. So often, hey, where's my buckle? Or my, get my triangle, please. Throw a hook into the offside body. You know this hook thing, right? So come on over here. So I say stand. Actually, do it to me. That way, if you hit me, throw. Okay. So now do the whole thing. But what happens is, as soon as he hits me, I go ah! <laughs> right? Because my shield just got knocked the hell out of the way. Have you ever been in the shower and somebody rips the curtain open? <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> If I'm going to throw the outside body, don't block or I'm just going to come in and throw the outside body. If I'm going to throw the outside body, I'm not touching the shield. The hook is to hook the shield open, not to rip it open. In other words, this is an ill-timed hook. Because he knows what happened. This is the hook I want. See what happened? As soon as he saw the sword coming, the shield went back and it hooked it open. He didn't realize it was happening until after the shield came in like a door stop. <laughs> Correct. Correct. The subtlety is after. The subtlety is after. Ripping their shield open does nothing, but gives them the opportunity to realize what you just did. But placing your shield back there when they don't see it until it's too late is a lovely, lovely thing. Right? And that's how hooks work. That's how manipulation works. So, center grip rounds. There's only a couple of those in our tier. <laughs> That's a strap. Center, somebody give me a center for ground. Ah, there he is. Keep going hard. Center for ground. You would think this thing has no corners, but it does. The weak line of this shield is here, 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 and here. Anywhere the shield cuts away. Anywhere the shield cuts away. The trick is being in the best position to beat the line of the shield. If I am nose to nose to him, his leg locks there, his blocks there, his leg locks down here, his leg locks down here. But if I'm here, that line all of a sudden becomes lovely. This line becomes really cool. That line becomes lovely. This line is gorgeous. And anytime you can take a three-foot blocking surface and turn it into a half-inch blocking surface, it might be And then there. Being able to work with them and practice and memorize them is important. Armies, since the history of time, as in all martial arts, are based on the defense of the opponent. Say that again. All martial arts, all martial arts are based on the defense of the opponent. So if my, if I'm going and I'm a, a, a some country and I'm fighting a country that all has round shields, 
We're going to study that shield till we know its weakness. Right? The Roman legions knew that the Scutums were much better to press against body on body, against the Norse, because they could keep in line, lock in their shields, and rotate out. And rotate out. Bet you just talked to them. We know we talked to them. Then what happened? The Norse got, got wise and went, wait, broken fields and guerrilla warfare defeats the phalanx. Broken fields always defeat a phalanx. So how did they start fighting? Guerrilla style. Yeah and eventually the leeches broke. You always base your offense on the defense of the opponent. So if I'm fighting Okta, I know he's a left-handed fighter, and he's fighting with a scutum but has a center grip. I know it has pivots here, here, and here. I know he's left-handed. If I'm staying right-handed, which I shouldn't, but if I'm staying right-handed, I'm going to face the weapon constantly. 